radioactive panel prior to us. So you got a big job here, our last panel of the day, but uh, I think you're going to find that just as, uh, just as on fire as the last panel, all, all three of these panels, actually. Uh, before I get started, there are evaluation forms on your table, and we'd really appreciate it if you'd fill those out. Uh, leave them there. We'll pick them up. But uh, let us know what you think, what worked well, what didn't work well, and uh, that'll help us with the next one. So thank you. Um, I think on this next panel, uh, truth and testing, I, I think there is wide agreement that the way we are approaching testing in this country and in this state is not working. Uh, there are a few people who want to see us continue and invest in it, uh, and I think there is a broad agreement that we need to do better and find a better way to do it. Even Secretary Duncan this week at Stanford, the Education Writers Association uh, Conference, uh, made very strong statements about needing to find a better way, a better way of testing children and making sure our schools are delivering uh, for those kids. Uh, and so that's, that's the focus. And there's some key questions around this. Uh, there is change afoot with, uh, we've heard about the Smarter Balanced Consortium today a little bit the PARC uh, Consortium, and there's, these are two major efforts to redefine, transform how we test in this country. Uh, that's going to have a huge impact, we hope. And so one of the big questions is, uh, are, we, are these tests going to really transform the system? Are we going to be looking at something very different uh, that is also going to affect student outcomes in a positive way? Uh, there's a lot of people who are very hopeful, some who are on this panel, others who are skeptical, uh, and we're already starting to see with Common Core and with the assessments, with the development of the assessments, beginning to see pushback about it's going too fast or we're not prepared. So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, so on our panel, we're going to hear from Pedro Negrero, a very, very well-respected voice in education reform from New York University. We're going to hear from Linda Montez. Linda is a principal in Redwood City at the Spanish Immersion School. She is also a district leader, leader in heading up uh, district learning, English learning uh, services in, Re in the Redwood City School District. We're going to hear from Richard Colvin, who is a school accountability expert and also is a former executive director of the education sector. And we're going to hear from Deb Sigmund, California Department of Education, Deputy Superintendent of Public Information. It's great to have Deb here because she is really right now in one of the pilot seats uh, around the Smarter Balance Consortium, and she's on the executive committee, co-chair of the executive committee of, of that uh, consortium. So uh, I'm sure she's going to have a lot of information about where this is all headed and where California fits into this picture. Um, Lisa Andrew is... Uh, also uh, a, a district leader, and it's going to be very interesting to hear from Lisa because she's really on the front line, as is Linda, uh, around implementation of these new uh, approaches to assessments. So Linda heads up for Santa Clara County uh, Offices of Education, the uh, Division of Assessments and Accountability. Uh, so uh, we're very happy to have this panel here today, and we're just going to jump right in. I'm going to first ask uh, Pedro to step back and as you look at uh, where this shift is taking place now around the assessments and around the common core, uh, are these game changers? Do you see them really taking us to a very different place in the quality of education of our kids uh, and in the system? So thank you, Renee, and uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here, uh, great to get reacquainted with uh, the many policy challenges facing California. Uh, having lived here for 20 years myself, uh, I left in 2000, I think I left just as Linda was coming, so uh, you, got, you, you, you improved when you got Linda instead of me. Uh, um, <clears throat> but I, I would say that I saw California uh, go through its deterioration. Uh, I saw, I, was, I came in 1981, uh, as I said, when community college was still free. <laughs> and California was still uh, very high in the rankings of per people spending. Uh, by the time I left, uh, we were very far from the top in per people spending, and, uh, and public education, including higher education, was in free fall. Uh, <clears throat> I am not a believer that the Common Core will be a game changer. Uh, and, and I say that as a person who supports the Common Core. I think it is essential to have clear academic standards. Uh, I think it's a, a very important step for equity. 
The reason why I believe it will not be a game chamber is because I have no confidence at all that it will be implemented properly. I am already seeing evidence in New York State that implemented the assessments before they did any work to ensure that the teachers were trained or the students were exposed to the curriculum, how poorly this can be done. And I have no doubt that this will continue to happen because it it's part of a larger problem. The larger problem is that we have been using assessment inappropriately throughout this country since No Child Left Behind. Now, when people hear that, they take that as an argument against assessment. I am not against assessment. We absolutely must assess if we want to know how well our students are doing, are in fact they prepared for college or career or whatever else. But we have been using assessment largely for the purpose of ranking students and ranking schools. Ranking someone is not helping them. To tell a student that they are low or to tell a school that they are failing and then not provide guidance about what they need to do to improve is not a strategy for success. This is exactly what we've been doing throughout the country. And a big part of what's wrong is our policymakers continue to believe that designing the right assessment is what's going to improve our schools. Now, I want to refer you to an article by Michael Fullen uh, that was written two years ago on, on drivers of reform. And in the article, Michael makes the case that if you look at the countries that have made the most progress in the last several years, they are relying on different drivers, and high-stakes testing is not one of them. They are focused on capacity building in schools. And let me illustrate how that works in Ontario, Canada, but more sp specifically Toronto, which is the largest urban district in Canada and has the greatest number of high poverty schools and has also had the greatest improvement over the last several years. Capacity building in Canada means that when a school is not performing based on a state assessment or pro provincial assessment, they then send experts in to go and figure out why and what needs to be done differently. And then they focus their professional development on precisely the areas where the students need help. Now that sounds logical, but it's not what we do. Right? That is, we tell a school they're failing, and the operative assumption is that pressure and humiliation will lead to improvement. Right? So state of Florida puts letter grades on schools, something New York State has now adopted, so you can go to a a school all the way down to an F school. The only strategy ha they have in place for an F school is school closure. Right. Even though there are, they're, they're growing F schools in New York. Right. And all you have to do is look at those schools and you would find that those schools were set up to fail because they were overpopulated with the most disadvantaged students and staffed by the least prepared teachers. I am not a believer that this is going to change under the Common Core. In fact, I believe that <clears throat> the work that needs to be done to develop the curriculum and prepare the teachers, particularly in schools that are serving large numbers of English language learners and our poorer students, hasn't even started. So I am not only skeptical, I am highly critical of this whole strategy because I keep what I see happening over and over again is we we keep thinking that simply by raising the standards, we will have accomplished something. And the hard work is in going into those schools and figuring out what needs to be done to change them. We have examples of this happening now across the country, of schools that improved. And I'll say it again, we should be learning from those examples. Deb, you've been sitting with the Smarter Balanced Consortium for a good stretch now from its beginning. And talk to us a little bit about where is the consortium and your view of where these new assessments are going to take us and whether it's going to be a game changer for kids. Uh, so I have a, I think I'm a little bit more optimistic. Um, <laughs> since, I, since I sit in the Department of Education, perhaps I need to be. But, but uh, I, I actually, uh, I do think that, um, now uh, the assessments aren't the 
only game changer, but I think without producing new assessments and new kinds of assessments that get at deeper learnings and really promote different kinds of uh, instruction inside the classroom uh, that we're not gonna move anywhere. So the state of California, as those of you who are teachers know, we have been, for the last dozen years, our assessments are strictly multiple choice assessments. Um, and very much uh, support the kind of system that you just described. Uh, so we actually think that Smarter Balanced, and remember it's not just that summative assessment. Smarter Balanced is a system of assessments that probably the most important assessment within that system is the formative tools. The group of digital library resources that we believe will help teachers actually look at what their students are doing throughout the year. We think that's a far better way to look at students and, and provide supports for teachers as they try to uh, give students the tools they need to get better. So um, we think that that's a better system. We're excited to have that. We've just introduced a bill in the legislature, uh, uh, AB 484, that we think that the state of California should invest in not just a summative assessment, but these formative tools for teachers and the interim assessments, because that, we think, will be the game changer. To stop using assessments for what we have been using them for. We're not supportive of misuse of assessments, and we think that building in a system of assessments that can provide information to teachers is really the way to do that. Now, it's not the only thing, and I think that uh, certainly the supports around professional learning um, are key in terms of making sure that we have a successful implementation of Common Core. And, uh, you know, the assessments are kind of a piece of it. Uh, we keep trying to tell people it's not the end of the system, it's not the end of the, of the journey in terms of getting to a set of college and career ready standards. It really is kind of the beginning, and so we're, we're trying to make sure that folks understand that. But we think that Smarter Balance, if used appropriately, can actually be a very important part of that game okay. changing system. Let's put a big pin in that if. Yeah. So I wanna get back to that, okay? So Linda, <clears throat> I have four kids. Three of them are still in public schools. So should, as a parent, should I be hopeful uh, about what's coming down the line with uh, these new assessments? Uh, and you are leading a school and you are also leading a district uh, with some very specific needs. So where are you on this as a principal and what kind of change this is gonna to bring to your schools? Are you hopeful? Uh, so I think there's a balance. So many years ago, one of my favorite professors said, and I remember this clearly, he said to the class, folks, two things you never wanna see made, textbooks and sausages, <laughs> or frameworks and sausages, and that was Dr. Kurse. So Dr. Kurse, I added to that and said, <laughs> state standards and sausages and like state assessments. So, um, but I'm hopeful with the Common Core, and I'm hopeful because um, it, ch it does change. It changes how we see the instruction, what students need to be successful. In the past, our standards were too narrowed, it narrowed our curriculum. Um, it didn't allow for the integrated instruction that it's looking for now to teach language arts across the content areas. Too many schools took that to mean we weren't to teach, we could not or didn't have the time to teach science or social science or include arts and dance and music and all these things, especially for students who were from low performing schools or low socioeconomic communities. So what I see that it does is take our current view of what education should be and it includes um, opportunities for students to think critically, to engage in the content, to use informational text, to speak collaboratively with their partners, to come to come an understanding. Um, I don't think it's the only thing. Um, I'm hopeful because of these types of conversations that we're having. Because you see that it's not just about the standard. It's not the standard that's going to change what we do. It's how we look at it and the professional development that we can provide. I think that there is a lot of work to do. I think that um, ongoing discussions of looking at what has worked and what hasn't worked has led our district into looking more deeply now into Common Core, um, determining what professional development is, is needed for the teachers, for administrators, um, and moving to that next level of understanding 
before we begin full implementation. There, we do, yes, lack resources, which uh, Pedro talked about earlier. Rather than look at regulations, what can we do? We can look at how the professional development is provided, provide for the resources so that we can adequately provide for the professional development, adequately provide for the technology that will be needed in order to facilitate the use of technology in the classroom and for students to have access. Not all students have the same access. Um, I'm hopeful because uh, I still believe that as individuals, as administrators, I actually believe that I can change what happens in a school. I know that I can. Um, uh, but I do need the supports. I need uh, the financial support. We need uh, true professional development that is not a curriculum publishing company coming to tell us how to use their curriculum. We can figure that out. We need what is honest professional development to ensure teachers are moving to that next level that would be required under Common Core. Great, thank you. So Lisa, you're responsible for scaling up these assessments uh, in how many districts in, in uh, Santa Clara County? 31. 31 districts. So talk to us about what you think is gonna be needed to actually achieve scale on this and where are the bottlenecks? Uh, Pedro pointed out a few of these things, a very pessimistic idea, uh, viewpoint of being able to scale and implement. So you have to do it. And so talk to us about how you're gonna be held accountable for it and what you need. Right. So first I wanna say I'm a product, a proud product of the California school system, okay? Um, went to community college here in California, yeah. Went to two state schools, so it can happen, all right? Um, and before I get into answering that, I think we need to take a, a little bit higher level look at just what testing means for all the different people in this room. Um, first and foremost, I'm a parent, a PTA parent. So, right? So what, what testing means to a parent and getting their child ready and supporting that is, is, is different than what I currently do. I'm also a parent of biracial children who never scored proficient on any state test, ever. And they have a college-educated mother. Research says they should be doing great. Never, ever, neither one of them scored proficient on a state test. I'm a homeowner. Test scores mean something to my home value. And we know that a lot of school districts have to contend with that. And as we switch to a different accountability system and testing system, that has raised the concern of a lot of districts that I deal with. And when um, superintendents and their boards and teachers talk to me about should we, should we not? How do we do this and still maintain all of that? It's a very real um, uh, reality. And then as you said, Renee, I'm the one that has to do it because I'm told so. A teacher that had to administer the tests, an administrator that was ha held accountable for my test scores every time I met with the superintendent, and then as a district administrator who had to look at the school board and report on how our students were performing and what was I gonna do tomorrow to make those tests better? So when we get into this conversation about testing, it affects us all differently. But those are lenses that every time we make a decision at the federal level, the state level, the local level, we have to look through each one of those lenses because that's where pe people get really passionate and emotional about the, the issue. Um, I agree so much with Pedro. I'm starstruck, okay? <laughs> I, um, I just finished my doctorate and like, I cited him. <laughs> so when they put our name tags up here, I'm like, Stardust is gonna rub off. I'm so excited. So um, this, this is like one of those, you know, bucket list moments for me. It's like, wow, I get to be in agreement and sitting next to Pedro, so we'll talk Okay, about enough it. on Pedro, right. Lisa, let's. So, uh... so now that I got all that out, um, but I just think it's good to set that context. So I'm charged with, as Renee said, making sure that districts are ready for assessments in spring of 2015. Whether I agree with it or not, my charge is to get them ready. And when you think about scaling up and what needs to be done, just like a teacher in a classroom, the districts that we serve in Santa Clara County are all at different levels of readiness. So it's very much individualized while it also has to be very standardized because we do wanna keep that equity there. 
So some of the um, uh, issues that we contend with is yes, there's a resource issue, but truly, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, and I might be out there um, on my own on this, districts do have money that they could make better decisions with, okay? I'm, I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, you are making decisions to buy certain things, and so there is a priority thing that, that that's what I've seen in my county. Um, we also have to have a priority. When I sit down with districts, it's, well, we don't have the technology. We don't have the computers. We don't have the bandwidth, okay? It's not gonna really matter if you have that computer first if the teacher doesn't know how to teach the Common Core and how to prepare the students for the Common Core. So as everyone has said since I've, I've been here this morning, we have to invest in that teacher professional development, which means more than buying a curriculum that's, that, that has the Common Core standards in them, because we've done that already. With the CST, we built curriculum that had the California state standards in them. Okay? Just delivering that purple box with a purple bow is not gonna do it. Teachers have to have the professional development on the curriculum, on the standards, they need professional development on how to design lessons that now incorporate the 21st century skills of um, problem solving, critical thinking, communicating, and collaborating. Let me ask you a question. What's yeah. keeping you up at night and getting this done? You. <laughs> What's keeping you up? People not having the courage to do it. Say more. No one. There's, or I shouldn't say no one, very few people like change. Very few people thrive on change. And so what folks do is because of their fear of change and what that means for me, then they do not have the courage to do what needs to be done. They don't allocate the dollars, they don't face the inequities, they don't inform their school boards, they don't, um, parents don't you know, demand it that we, this is on, you know, it's been here since 2010, it's not going okay. away. All right, great. So Richard, what's all the pushback about? So people are pushing back on Common Core, going too fast, pushing back on the assessments, going too fast, can't possibly get this done by 1415. So you look at school about accountability, you're an expert, step back. What do you see happening here? What's this all about? Um, I think Lisa hit on it to some degree. Um, you know, there is never any natural constituency for change. There just isn't. And change causes conflict. And if we expect big changes in any systems, any society to, go, to not cause conflict, then we're just fooling ourselves. My view of school districts is that they are a very, very complex network of uh, uh, complex balance of different needs, different interests, different political constituencies and values. And it may sound a bit cynical to say, but I think it's true that every school district, like any other bureaucracy, operates the way it does because it has balanced all of those needs and interests in a way that people can accept. And so when you start making big changes, somebody is gonna be unhappy. So that's, that's sort of the big picture on, on why we're having the pushback. Um, Pedro is right. Um, I'm not quite a groupie of Pedro, but, but I, I think he's, uh, <laughs> uh, he's been a touchstone for me for many years, and he, he takes this larger view of things. So he is right that we're moving fast. Um, there are, how to say this, um, m the vast majority of state superintendents of public instruction in this country are telling the people who are behind the Common Core, do not stop. Keep pushing forward, because this is an opportunity to not just, and Pedro's absolutely right, you can't just change because you have different standards or you have harder assessments. You can't, but you can motivate people. We've got 45 states that have said, you know what, we're signed on. That means that there's enormous political capital throughout this country to making the Common Core work, to investing what it's gonna take to improve the level of teaching. Let me just say, we've had been at the standards game since um, the early 90s, when the federal government uh, in the Clinton administration said every state had to develop standards. And uh, so we've had accountability and we've had standards and you know the API ratings have gone up and more than half of the schools in California are above the 800 level and so everything ought to be fine. 
Well, when you've got 85% of community college students in California needing remediation, 56% of CSU students needing remediation, and 26% of UC students needing remediation, we need a reset. Nine, in 1999, when the API was established in this, Calif in, in this state, it was established to measure the uh, progress on achieving proficiency, proficiency. You know, a lot has changed in the global economy around technology, around, you know, the level of manufacturing in this country. A lot has changed since 1999, and we still have the API that's targeted to proficiency that's a pretty low level. And so if at some point we don't say, you know what, our kids today are working in a very, are going to come out into a very different economy than they came out um, graduated into in 1999 and if we don't try to have a reset which should trigger everything that we know makes a difference more investment smarter spending stop spending money on things that don't work invest in professional development you know raise teacher standards all of those things if we don't do all of those things the common core won't work but unless we have a starting point that motivates our decisions about all of those things we're not gonna make any progress okay okay Two quick questions. One is, Deb, all right, what do you tell a parent who says, why should I care about this? Because I, I, don't, I, I, I don't understand how my kid is being tested now other than star <coughs> testing. And I know when that happens. Uh, but what's, what's going to be so different about this? And why should I be happy that my child is going to be tested in this different way? Well, I, I think I'd if they came to me with that question, I'd start talking about uh, not just the assessment, but what the assessment is measuring. And it, that's about a new set of standards that uh, are meant to really get our students to be college and career ready. And uh, so I try to move them away from the assessment, right? The assessment is, I mean, we talk a lot about it, and I know how important it is, and I know for districts and teachers and principals, I get how important it is. But at the end of the day, it's just, it's an instrument, it's a tool. What, what really is important is what's going on in that classroom and what that student is learning. But so I, I want, yeah, that's what I want to know. But how, I want to know if my kid is learning or not. So how is this assessment or these assessments what are, it's going to tell me in a better way? So they are going to tell you in a better way at the end of the year. So that little, you know, your, your annual checkup is going to be a more precise measurement of what your student is able to do. But along with that, there will be other tools that will help your child's teacher help you help your student to be better at what they do. So I, they are better. They're going to provide more information. They're going to provide more precise information. They're going to hopefully reflect what we want to be happening in our classroom. So uh, when we give a performance task, we're going to talk about much deeper, richer kinds of things that we want our students to know as opposed to just being able to uh, command a, uh, some kind of st uh, fact or statistic. We want our kids to be thinkers. We want our kids to be collaborators. And these assessments will help guide that instruction. So okay. we think that they will model uh, much more deeper learning and uh, teaching. Okay. All right. Linda, are you confident that that's what you're going to be able to tell parents who go to your school? I think what they'll see are the discussions or Walking into a classroom will look a little different, I think. Um, well, hopefully a lot different um, if we do the professional development correctly. Again, it's not just the standards. Um, what it will look like are uh, students engaged in conversation about their learning and their thinking, uh, more projects that um, don't test, and we because we're not repairing, preparing for hundreds and hundreds of standards. Um, they're more global, they're more uh, deeper understanding levels, standards. Um, I think that, again, it's not just the assessment. And there are other ways that we can assess students' learning. And those have to happen along the way. It can't be just one end of the year assessment. OK. Let me ask folks to come to the microphones if you have questions about the assessments. Um, one other question to the panels. People want to see the state's role in testing changed. Uh, there is um, uh, some signaling that the state is going to change, uh, that it's going to take a different approach. Um, what's that role? What should that role be? 
and when is going to happen? You talk about assessment or uh -huh, on assessments and the way we're doing yeah. it now. Yeah, is that going to change significantly the way the state is going to do it? Well, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> we've just introduced a bill to really. Uh, we believe that you, you kind of have to stop what you're doing. Uh, we want to change the assessment system. Where uh, Superintendent Torgerson is asking that we suspend at this point for next year all non-federally required assessments. Uh, we think this is a way to, to kind of get people thinking in a different way. We want our assessments to look different uh, so that they can reflect the kind of teaching and learning that we want to be happening in our classroom. And we want to think about what is the role of the state. Does the state need to know what every student is doing in a biology or a physics or a chemistry class or a U.S. history class every year uh, on a multiple choice assessment. We don't think that that's a good use of resources. We think that those resources can be better used inside a classroom and for better kinds of assessments that give teachers better information about their kids. Does that make sense from where you're sitting, Lisa? Uh, I, yes, it, it, it makes sense. I think, though, that, that a missing component in the conversation is no matter what the assessment system is, it is going to be used for our accountability for the federal government. So even if, if we have assessments that are um, uh, more deeply giving us information about what students are able to do and how they think, those assessments are still going to be used to rank us and um, let the federal government know how we're doing. And so I, I, you know, I just want to make sure that we're okay. aware that that is deeply linked, and while we may um, think that the assessments themselves are more beneficial, they still are going to be used in ways that we were talking about prior. Okay. Pedro, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I would say the state needs to radically change the way it relates to schools. That is that it should be that the state should be able to deploy experts who can go into a school or a district and help them. Say, this is what you should be focused on. This is, what, this is what it's going to take in your district to be able to serve your student needs. That means that rather than going into measure and, and, and monitor, they actually go into help. It's a different approach, right? But what's the record of state, state takeovers right now in California? It's a horrible one. It's not as though when the state comes in that suddenly things get better. So we need to shift the, you know, we talk so much about accountability. We hold the, the, the most vulnerable people accountable, the kids. Then we work our way up to the teachers, now we, the principals. Accountability should be two-way. State should be accountable. What should the, and, and, and if schools are not performing, then the state needs to change the way it relates to these districts so it can provide tangible assistance to help schools to get better. Okay, let me, let me take a few questions here, so we'll start off on my left here. Yes, I'm excited about Common Core from the perspective of what I see with the standards and with what's going to change with teaching. I think that's going to serve our students really, really well. I'm concerned about what I'm hearing about the assessment. Who are you? I, I'm Diane Jones. I'm a parent in Fremont Unified. Thank you. Um, I have three kids there, and the concern I have is that we're changing from, it seems to me, from one high-stakes assessment culture to another, that, and that isn't going to change. But one of the the concerns I had was at a, a meeting that I attended in Fremont about Common Core, hearing about what these assessments are going to be like, and I think there are some good things. I was concerned when I heard that our third and fourth graders are going to be taking a computer-based test and expected to keyboard in basically an essay response to something. And I'm wondering if that is even developmentally appropriate for them to be expected to do. And if we haven't thought through that basic sort of question, what else are we kind of missing here? But I'm really concerned about, uh, about the appropriateness of the kinds of testing I'm hearing we're going to be doing. Who wants to respond? Lisa, Deb? Yeah. Um, that, that is a huge concern for the teachers that we train. There's a whole digital literacy piece that um, needs to come in. Now, I know that we are going to be able to give a paper version and then that has to lead to eventually a computer version. But beyond teaching new standards, new assessments, with new assessment types, we also are now going to have to teach third graders digital literacy skills. I just 
I took one of the, te the a simulation of one of the tests recently, and I think the third screen that I went to, it was a list of 42 directions on right clicking, highlighting, move your arrow, um, how to click here, click there, how to draw a line, and I too was like, oh my goodness, because I don't know how many adults could do all those things. So that is a, another layer that's going to be added to the responsibility of our teachers is to make sure that our students are able to use those types of skills. Okay, let's go over to the right. Thank you. No. Thank you. My name is Jim Zito. I'm a uh, trustee at the Evergreen Elementary School District. Uh, thank you, board. You're all gurus in my eyes. Uh, I agree with Richard. I agree with Pedro. Uh, we don't like to change. There's no question about it. But when tell, we tell me your question. Uh, the question. Well, the question basically is, you know, what do you feel about the fact that assessment for the sake of assessment is ludicrous? Okay. Assessment must lead to change, and I think that's the missing element here. I think we have to assess. We assess all day long. We assess whether we make a turn. Okay, yeah, you're making a statement here. Tell me your question. That's the question. Is, okay. is, you know, who, wants, who wants to respond to that? Well, let me, let me just start real quickly. Um, I think all of this co conversation needs to, just a, a tiny little bit of context. There, everything is changing right now over the next several years. We're going to have new assessments. They're being developed. They're going to come in, into play for the first time in 2015. California is kind of rethinking its uh, API system and um, how that, how the new assessments will play into that and when that should come into play. Uh, there's a huge amount of progress being made in, in the actual um, technology of testing so that it is more adaptive. The question about computerization that is going to be rocky at first, but eventually that's going to lead to lots of, uh, lots of improvements. Assessment is, is for a bunch of different purposes, and I'll quickly tick them off. We want to inform the public and policymakers generally about how our schools are doing. Teach, we want assessment to inform teaching and learning in the classroom, not just the teachers, but the students themselves, so that they know how they're progressing. They need very, very different information than the public and the, the policymakers. We want uh, assessment results to be used to some degree for management purposes. That's controversial. We also want it to be used for how to direct resources. That could be controversial. But you're absolutely right. Asset, we are, there is no, anytime you learn anything, you're, you're constantly assessing your progress. So when we say stop testing or we're going to opt out of testing or end testing, that's, that's ridiculous. But we should keep in mind what are the purposes of assessment and we should make sure that we have the right tools and we're using them appropriately. Great. Uh, to segue perfectly, I wanted to ask what your thoughts were about parents choosing, you tell us who you are? choosing to opt out of testing. I, my name's Carissa Kluver. I'm a parent in San Luis Coastal. I come from a research background, recently moved from Washington State, and I'm planning to opt my child out. And I think it's a movement that should be taken seriously. And I'm curious, the panel's other panel. You know it's ridiculous. So. so she wants her child to opt out of testing? Yes. So, you repeat the question. Sorry. So the question is, what do, you, what do we think about parents opting out? Yeah. So the state of California allows parents to opt out of the, any of our uh, STAR assessments. Um, that, was a, that was a law that was put in place. Obviously, it was important to the legislature at, at the time. Um, you know, uh, there is, th those assessments are used for federal accountability purposes, and so districts are always faced with this issue that they need to make sure that they get 95% of their students tested, which of course, you know, we're, we're fully supportive of changing No Child Left Behind. We're way overdue, so I would say, you know, if there's anything to be done, we'd like Congress to get on the stick and do something different about our federal accountability and assessment system. But having said that, uh, I don't think that's going to change. I think it would be a shame to, if in fact, I, I firmly believe that these assessments are going to provide new and different and more appropriate information. So I would, I would encourage folks to have that kind of information. Recall the, these assessments are not high stakes for our children at this point. Uh, we're trying to keep it that way. So uh, we hope that they'll provide necessary and uh, good information for parents and teachers. I realize that a lot of the- Who are you? My name's Shannon Zemer, and I'm from Orange County, um, on the PTA in Orange County. 
And in our area, one of the big issues we're facing that's beyond the control of the schools is bandwidth. Though many schools are suffering from lack of computers or how they're gonna manage just even getting that many kids through a computer lab, and I realize there's a paper test for the first few years, something beyond their control that they can't cope with, and I'm wondering if anyone has thought of any way to deal with this, is the bandwidth to have 30 tests, or have several children testing online at once, because that's off their sites. So, sure. So uh, keep in mind that, that the Smarter Balance Assessment is, uh, there's a 12-week window, and so we've just <coughs> produced a little uh, algorithm uh, that's available to folks so that to, that would tell you how many computers you'll need to kind of, uh, you know, have students, uh, if you have a lab, then you should have enough. The uh, Smarter Balance recognizes that there are lots of different kinds of configurations out there in schools, so we're trying to set up a system that really would uh, allow maximum opportunity for all of our schools to be able to um, use the technology component of this assessment. Um, uh, you know, the superintendent is uh, very concerned about uh, funding mechanisms, so we're encouraging uh, some money to be used uh, in terms of technology infrastructure and that kind of thing. We think that'll be important. Um, and again, we'll have the three years. And, you know, changes, I, I suspect that we'll go longer than the three years. Uh, if, if you ask me in a couple of years, I think I might have a different opinion. But I think we'll probably have that paper pencil available for longer. Great. Lisa, quick uh, response. Yeah. Um, just the, a couple of comments. I would disagree. I think any time you put a third grader, fourth grader, or fifth grader in front of a computer and take a test, it's a high stakes. Um, that's, that causes a lot of anxiety for a student. Even though our kids are born, you know, going like this, um, it's, it's different, you know, sitting in front of taking this test is a lot different than going like this or going like this. So we just really need to um, prepare things you can do at home, preparing them with those skills would, would, would be great. I also, the three month window that is being proposed is also causing a lot of anxiety. Who wants to be the teacher that teaches at the beginning, or that takes the test at the beginning of those three months, and then be the teacher that gets to take the test at the end of that three months? So while it, it, yes, it does, thank you, it does help to, to take care of the issue of we only have 30 computers in one computer lab, it's still the, the amount of teaching that a teacher will get to um, attend to before they test is, is causing some anxiety out there. Um, Deb did speak to there are dollars that, a lot of dollars, like billions of dollars that um, we were, I was just with Tom Torlickson the other day, that are coming, we need to write the governor. You need to write the governor. Because the more they hear from us, the more than, as these decisions and the May revise is coming up, you will be heard. There are billions of dollars that are coming and we are asking for them to be specifically earmarked for the implementation of the Common Core. When we implemented the California state standards, we did get specialized earmark money just for that. And there is talks about that occurring now, but we need to have our voices heard on those billions of dollars. And those dollars will be used for either professional development, curriculum, or for um, technology. So get out there, write the governor, write often, tell your neighbors. Okay, last comment, Linda. So there are issues of equity. Not all schools have the same number of computers, et cetera, and not all students have the same, as you know, background in using technology. So, and then if you're taking the pencil, pencil and paper test, you can do that one time. If you're doing it online, you can actually take it, it twice, right? So again, issues of equity. Not all schools have that capability. So okay. it is an issue. Sorry, folks. Uh, Renee, could I push back for one moment to my colleague over here? Just, just for one second. Um, Your time is up. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You know, the idea that new money needs to be added on to implement the standards, in my mind, is, is, is not, not right. I mean, what about all of the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that's being spent on professional development now? Why keep doing that professional development? Why not take that money and prepare people for the common core? I mean, you can't keep spending all the money that you have now in the same way. Larry Pankis is sitting right out here. He taught me something very important. New money that comes into school district almost always is spent the same way as the old money. So why not take some of that old money and repurpose it so that it's more efficient? Okay, great. 
I'm sorry, folks, we're out of time. Thank you, panelists. I really appreciate your weighing in on this feature. Thank you.